Hello everyone, welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Israel. This is Parashat Vayechi. He lives because he does. Genesis 47, 28 to 50, 26. The end of the book. This one's called Times of Trouble and When You Least Expect It. I couldn't really decide, but they're both very relevant and so true. So lots been going on. I know this is going to be a heavy, long, deep, frustrating teaching, but stick around. It'll be worth it. This is the culmination of everything we've been going through thus far. Vayechi Yaakov and Jacob lived. Now, these are some powerful words because they mean so much more than Jacob living or dwelling in the land of Egypt. Jacob is Israel. We are Israel. We are Jacob. How did he get to the point where he actually lived? If now he lived, that means that beforehand he must have not lived, right? Been dead, perhaps. See last week's teaching of resurrection of the dead. By the way, these teachings are built one on top of the other, so if you missed the last few, chaval, go there. What does living mean? And what do we as individuals and as a nation have to go through in order for life to be given to us? Or in other words, what is this thing called Jacob's trouble that we have to go through? Considering the times that we currently live in, I think it's important to be prepared for anything. And anything means that whatever might happen, there is also a good chance that you won't see it coming, or when you least expect it. And this is because it is a common battle tactic to raise a smokescreen or cause a diversion. This is how the adversary works. And when I say adversary, I also mean those who are in his employ. And I'll say something else. Most of those who are working for the other guy have no idea that they are. And God willing, I will reveal all that to you, but at a later date, okay? So help me God, I will. I want to so bad, but I, I got my own restrictions on me of what I can and cannot share. Now's not the time. So, he won't come at you head on. Why would he? When you're expecting him. That's foolish. Why would you do that? When you're at your strongest, at your best. It's not a matter of pride for him. Oh, let's meet face to face, man to man in the field of battle. It doesn't work like that. He just wants you to fall, right? He fights dirty. Honor has nothing to do with it. This is how he was created and how he was created to act, okay? There's also the element of divide and conquer. As we will hit you while you are awake and, I mean, he's gonna hit you while you're awake and his wife is gonna hit you when you're asleep. And if you could get hit while you're asleep, that must mean that by default there is a way for you to defend even while you are asleep. You can get distracted even for one second and trip up, which is why there always has to be uh, contingency plans. Your contingency plans are your main plans to get through anything and everything. In most cases, it'll be contrary to popular belief, and they might go against nature and what may, be, may even be perceived as rational thought. But if you think about it, as Israel, we are the only nation that are actually above nature, as we have no governing, governing angel over us, but the master of the universe himself. And this is why we continue doing the one thing that we know for sure cannot be questioned. And this is why we are called to guard it with our lives. And that is learning Torah and living according to the mitzvot that we have received, that have been passed down from Moses till this very day. And this is also, as we discussed last week, how we know the identity of Messiah as well as the false Messiah, right? This is, and this is something that your soul would depend upon. We know we follow the Torah, and as God warned us, there would be one claiming to be him or several performing miracles and prophecies and all that good stuff, of course. You know, the, the flashy things that catches people's attention. 
But if he, that individual, deviates from the Torah one iota, he needs to be put to death. This is the words of God in Deuteronomy. If a certain man would come and say, hey, look at the miracles that I just performed, I'm the guy. Great, that's very impressive. And then he says to you that you need to, you know, hate your father and your mother in order to be part of his posse. But we, as knowing Torah, knowing Torah, it clearly states in several places that one must honor, respect, and fear their father and mother. It's written in the Ten Commandments, right? Which I would like to say that most of the world holds very dear to that. Do we think for one second that this person who tells us to go against the Ten Commandments is Messiah? Well, Jews don't, or shouldn't. How about if someone does, you know, wonderful miracles and then says, Hey, I need you to hate your brother and your sister if you want to come with me. But we, as knowing the Torah, also know that it says, You shall love thy neighbor. We also know that it is the most important thing to loving one another and having peace with one another because it's the most important aspect of Shevet Achim Gam Yachad, a tribe of brothers dwelling together. What are we reading about with Joseph? Because when people are at peace, loving one another, even if they are wicked idolaters, oh yes, the Lord leaves them alone and actually blesses them throughout history. If someone were to come and say that, you know, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring war, or the sword, eh, believe them. And if you learn Torah, and then you know exactly what to do. See, we know better than this, right? The book of Numbers, it says, Therefore I hereby give him my covenant of peace, shalom. And in Psalms, Shun evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. This is what God tells us to do. It's all about the peace, not about not the peace. And in literally hundreds of places all throughout the Torah, the city of God is called Yerushalem. Behold, peace. So if someone were to come claiming to be Messiah and say things like, For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against a mother, a daughter against... Uh, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, believe that person that that is what will be and run for your life. The thing is, only those who actually cleave to the tree of life will do so because they know what the Torah says. For I, the Lord your God, tests you. God knew these times were coming. He knew everything. He allowed it to happen. He, he made it happen. And he knew that the entire world would be deceived, as they are. And yet still he calls his children out, those who can understand the truth. Isaiah 45, 20. Assemble and come, approach together, you survivors of the nation. Yeah, you're going to have to survive that one. Those who carry their graven wooden image hmm, and pray to a God who does not save, do not know. I wonder what that is. It's been written already thousands of years ago. In fact, there are certain timelines that our sages actually give us that'll help us understand better where we stand. They actually give timelines. When, from exactly the time when Mashiach could come, and let me tell you something, it was about, what is it, 1700 years ago, from that time forward, okay? Meaning not before, and there's a reason for that. I don't have time or the patience to get into it right now, but everyone could believe what they want. I'm talking to my fellow Jews here right now. Do not be deceived. Remember how the adversary comes at us, because you won't see him coming until it's too late. But if you keep your eyes focused on that, which never changes, never changes, if we could all agree on what never changes, right? The Word of God. You will clearly be able to see all the, uh, all the um, perver uh, perversions of the world, if you will. Now again, also the Word itself has been perversed, uh, perverted, excuse me. 
when they wrote the Torah, they changed it into Greek and then uh, translated into English and whatever and so on and so forth. And then people are like, look, here's the word. It says this. I'm like, no, it doesn't. It never says that. You've got to go back to the sources. And if you do, then you might question your entire religion. It's like a merry-go-round from hell, okay? <clears throat> That's spinning so fast that you begin to lose your mind. You're on that merry-go-round, but you're not exactly aware of what's going on because it's spinning so fast. But the closer you actually get to the center, the part that does not move, the Torah and God, the spinning starts to lose its effect, right? It's not as bad as if you were further away. So you could sort of see what's going on. And when you finally, if you finally manage to get to the center, the one true constant that never changes, you'll see everything else changes except for that. The emet, the truth that always was, all of a sudden you stop spinning while you watch everyone else lose their godforsaken minds. And how is this? How is that? When you see it and you see them spinning, but they don't see themselves spinning. Because you then attach yourself to God. <clears throat> you then see the world through the eyes that he gave you to see the world. You happen to have a chair right there with your name on it. Where were you? Here's your popcorn. Enjoy. Thereby elevating yourself above it while you look about and heartache and see the truth of what's going on. Jews are people too. We are stiff-necked right we've been called that we are that but this is a blessing and a curse because we are not easily swayed unless it's done cunningly by the adversary through fear the talmud says that there are three things that come upon man when he least expects it gimel bein bein coming behesechadat when you are distracted Eluhen, they are mashiach metzia veakrav there are three matters that come only by means of diversion of attention from those matters when you least expect it and these are Mashiach a lost item and a scorpion now it could seem like the good the bad and the ugly right but it's not okay so why Messiah because we have no idea where all the sparks of Kedusha are in the world and we have no idea what God's timeline is we don't know we see signs we have better understanding but that time you don't know it it just oh now is the time god will let you know when it is why a lost item because if you're not looking for it then by default it just happens upon you either it belongs to you or you didn't even know it was gone like if you find a c note in your winter coat right like whoa i haven't worn this in a couple years now and Look, there's money in the pocket. Awesome. Were you looking for that? No, it happened upon you. Or if you find some money, let's say, in the street or a treasure or something, like, wow, I was not looking for this, and yet here it is. So that happened upon you. Okay, you could, it's like a gift that's coming at you. What about a scorpion? A snake and a scorpion go together. We've seen this. When Joseph was thrown into the pit with no water, the lack of water meant that there was no Torah in the actions of his brothers at the time. But well, we've learned that it was filled with snakes and with scorpions who specifically hid in the walls. Why? So when the brothers would look down and they would see the pit filled with snakes and scorpions and they weren't stinging Joseph, they'd be like, oh, we, we should probably, you know, take him out and apologize to him and dust him off and say, hey, buddy, we we're just we we're just messing around. Let's go back to dad. And this never happened. Right? But it showed that Joseph showed us that Joseph was protected. It showed Joseph that he was protected and would be protected from the snakes and the scorpions to come as well. In the book of Numbers, when the snakes and scorpions came upon the children of Israel, they knew <coughs> that they had sinned because they had not happened. Uh, they had not happened upon them for the entirety of 40 years that they were in the wilderness. The Shekhinah kept them away and every harmful thing away from them. Remember, that desert, that wilderness is designed to kill a man within one hour. The heat, the cold, the serpents, the scorpions, everything. Lack of food, lack of water, and so on. But primarily snakes and scorpions. Now, how do snakes and scorpions come upon you, right? When you least expect it. 
that really depends upon you and where you are at the time. Physically speaking, they hide in the dark. They don't just hang out during the day. They hide in cracks and little crevices and little holes and whatnot. In the wilderness, in the forests, in the jungles. Spiritually speaking, they also hide in the dark, in the wilderness, in the forests, or in the jungles. The, okay, you get it. Now, I'm speaking generally here, meaning you're less likely to run in the, into a snake or a scorpion if you're living in the city as if you would be living in the country. I know many of you are, so you probably got those in your backyard. Careful now. But the point is this. The snakes and scorpions represent exactly who and what you think they do. They are the dynamic duo who wait and crouch and hide and sneak and slither and whisper in the dark. And just like their methods of operation, you will never see them coming until it's too late. And if you do, you won't, know, you won't even know what's going on. In many cases, as we know, they are masters of disguise and deception. That's kind of the whole point. They don't walk around with signs, right? How does the rattlesnake come at you? By shaking its tail and attracting your gaze. What have I been saying? Hey, look at this. But in the meantime, what's going on down here? It attracts your gaze with that ominous sound. You're trying to find it. And then that sound can hurt you, if you will as you run from its tail right into its fangs. And what about a scorpion? Those big, those big claws are nothing but a distraction. I mean, sure, they could grab onto things, but that's not what's gonna kill you. The stinger that's gonna come from on top, hey, look at this, pow, gotcha. It'll drop on you from above and you'll never see it coming. Like the war profiteers that we've been discussing, who start the wars between both sides, and then they sell bullets and ammunition to both sides. <coughs> or like uh, the, the mafia, right? Who might destroy your shop and then ask for protection from, uh, you know, so it won't happen again. Maybe you should, sure, here you go. They might very well come as a form of a savior with an antidote already ready in a miraculously short amount of time to a problem that they themselves created. These are mob tactics, no? Do you know how dangerous this is? Do you know what this is called? This is called playing God, because that's what God does. Not the mob tactics, but I'll explain. And they are taking that which is holy and they are perverting it like all things. They are corrupting it. This is what the Sitra Akhra does. Now, we've discussed this before in Masechet Megillah 13b. Echad hadvarim ha'ele, Amar, Rabba Amar Shebara Kadosh Baruch Hu Efu'ala The verse describes when the rest of the events of the Megillah occurred after these events, what was going on in the Megillah, right? With uh, Haman and then Mordechai and so on and so forth. After these events, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman? After what? The Gemara asks, after what particular events? Rava said, only after the Holy One, blessed be he, created a remedy for the blow and set in place the chain of events that would lead to the miraculous salvation was Haman appointed, setting the stage for the decree against the Jews to be issued. God never gives us anything without creating the remedy. This is what they're doing in their own twisted way. You see that? Don't you see that? Rava explains, as Reish Laki said, the Holy One, blessed be he, does not strike at the Jewish people unless he has already created a remedy for them beforehand. As it is stated, when I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered. But this is not so with regard to the nations of the world. With them, God first strikes them, and only afterwards does he create a remedy. As it is stated, and the Lord shall smite Egypt, smiting and then healing. This is Isaiah 19.22. <clears throat> Don't let the serpent spite you and inject their poison into you. Now, as we have discussed oh so many times, there is an end to darkness, right? The, the kits, the sofa kits, sofa choshech. This is a Job 28.3. He made an end to darkness, and every end he fathoms a stone of darkness and the shadow of death. 
And the end of Jacob's troubles are also the end of the shadow of death, i.e. death itself, and all the implications that it carries. So if we know that there will be an end, then we also know that there are certain things that have to take place beforehand. Because what is the trouble that is being spoken of? We can start with uh, Isaiah 28, 14. Therefore, listen to the word of the Lord, men of scorn, allegorists of the people who are in Jerusalem. The serpents and scorpions, they're everywhere. And if you have a problem with this, then you have a problem with the word of God, because I'm just reading. For you said, we have made a treaty with death. And with the grave we have set a limit. When an overflowing scourge passes, it shall not come upon us. For we have made lies our shelter, and in falsehood have we hidden ourselves. Where would someone hide themselves so that things would pass over them? Perhaps underground. Make no mistake, and not for one second, the wicked know exactly who they are. They also know that there is no redemption for them in the choices that they've made. And so they fully and wholeheartedly at this point give themselves over to the Sitra Akhra in hopes that the forces of darkness protect them from what is to come. Therefore, so has the Lord God said, Behold, I have laid as a foundation a stone in Zion, a fortress stone, a costly cornerstone, a foundation well-founded, the believer shall not hasten. Who is this, the found, who is the foundation of Zion? These are the righteous who do not waver in the face of darkness. In addition to the foundations of Jerusalem just laying wait and ruin and dust of the earth, just waiting to be uncovered. Try and understand this for one moment, okay? It is the United Nations and UNESCO and Jordan and all the governments of the world and our current government who has a treaty with them that prohibits us from digging up the city of David. It is the Muslim world sanctioned by the Christian world who for the sake of obedience keep us from removing the abomination from above the Holy of Holies. How can this be? If they don't do it, and we don't do it, God's going to do it. And when God's going to do it, it's not going to be pretty. I don't recall what teaching it was, but we read from the Zohar that a quaking will come from the Holy of Holies, right underneath the Dome of the Rock over there, and it is going to destroy everything within a 45-kilometer radius. Why? Because unholy hands have built what is today the restored Jerusalem. And I will make justice the line. Fault line, maybe. Vesamti mishpat lakav. And righteousness the plummet. And hail shall sweep away the shelter of lies. And water shall flood the hiding place. It's pretty clear. In Hebrew, a fault line is called kav shevel. Vesamti mishpat lakav. Yep, that makes sense. I will lay judgment upon the line. And you will have very harsh judgments of hail. And then you will have cleansing water. Not to take a bath in, you know, remember the flood. Water always also finds the lowest points, spiritually as well, the spot where all the garbage juice is hanging out, and it cleanses and purifies it. These are natural disasters. You understand this, right? We're talking earthquakes, hailstorms, tsunamis, you name it, it's coming. And your treaty with death shall be nullified. No, no, no. No. And your limit with the grave shall not endure. When an overflowing scourge passes, you shall be trampled by it. Yeah, yeah. The score, when the scourge is coming and you, you think you're going to be hiding with the deals that you made? No, no. It's coming for you. What is scourge in Hebrew? Shot also means whip. Yep. And the word also has the same numerical value as seven times man, Adam, which is the root of the harshest judgment. When it passes, it shall take you 
For every morning it shall pass by day and by night, and it shall be one, and it shall only terror to understand the message. And it shall be only terror to understand the message. Vayalak zva'a, horror, terror, havin shmua, just to understand what is coming. What is baboker baboker in the morning? Why does it say twice? Morning is the time of Abraham, right? Chesed, that's mercy. But we know that judgment is coming upon them. And so it will be the judgment from within chesed itself, from within mercy. And it shall be only terror to understand the message at night. What's the message? You bet your soul on the losing team. That's the message, basically. For the bed is too short for one to stretch, and the ruler it shall be narrow than he enters. I'm going to read this in Hebrew. Tell me if any words pop out at you, okay? Ki katsar hamatza mehishtarea vahamasecha tsara kehitkanes. Let me give you a literal translation here from the Hebrew. For the bed sheets are too short to cover the bed, stretch, and the mask is trouble for you to enter. Or in other words, when you try to pull the sheets over your heads, trembling with fear within the bed that you made for yourselves, the mask that you hide behind will bring you nothing but trouble, and it will not save you. Or as Rashi said, Ki katsar hametza mishtara, ki avi alachem sone dochek etchem asher lo tochlu laspik avodato, kshayatsi amatsao alachem yikatser lo mishtara shochev alav. For the bed sheets are too short to cover the bed, or to stretch. For I will bring upon you one who hates you and pushes you to the point where you will have no rest from the work he places upon you. For even the sheets that he offers you will not cover the bed that you lay on. And the mask is narrow or trouble. Tzara, min hametzar. Tzara is straight, narrow, but tzara. Tzarat Yaakov, trouble. Jacob's trouble. The prince who will rule over you will press you as he enters into it. Into what? Into the mask and whatever you place behind that. Well, if you're looking for trouble, you came to the right place. So back to Sanhedrin. Etzukat David Hanofalit. Amar lehachi, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Dor sheben David ba, bo, talmidei chachamim mitma'atim, ve'ashar einehem kalot be'agon v'anacha, ve'tsarot rabot u'gzerot kashot mitchadshot ad harishona. Ad sharishona p'kuda, shniya v'maheret lavo. The tabernacle of David, that is fallen, Hanofalit, right? Amos 9.11. That is why the Messiah is called Bar Nifli. Rabbi Yitzchak said to him that this was what Rabbi Yochanan said. During the generation in which the Messiah, son of David, comes, Torah scholars decrease. We know that Torah is the light of the world, and the more the Torah is dwelt upon, more light, the more the light increases. The less Torah is learned, the more darkness grows, and well, 2020. And uh, do you have 2020 vision? And as for the rest of the people, their eyes fail with sorrow and grief, and troubles increase. And the harsh decrees will be introduced before the first passes, the second one quickly comes. No resting, no resting in between. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You understand? No relief. They will already overlap. Tanu Rabbanan. It says now, the week, the week meaning the year, the seven-year cycle, a day, a year. The sages sought in, uh, taught in a brighter with regard to the seven-year period, i.e. the sabbatical cycle, the Shemitah, during which the Messiah, son of David, comes. One, first year, Shana Rishona, Mitkayem Mikra Zeh, in Amos 4.7, V'himtarti al irachat v'al irachat lo amtir. During the first year, this verse will be fulfilled, and I will cause it to rain upon one city, and cause it not to rain upon another city. Amos 4.7. Second year, Shniah, 
חיצי רעב משתלחים. During the second year, literally arrows of famine will be shot, indicating that there will be famine only in certain places. Not famine bombs. You don't get food, and you don't get food, and you don't get food. See that, like that. Okay. Shlishit, <coughs> third, ra'av gadol. Ra'av, famine, gadol, great. Umetim anashim v'nashim v'taf, chasidim v'anshei ma'aseh, v'torah mishtakachat milomdeh. This is terrible. It's kind of like the chicken or the egg, right? During the third year, there will be a great famine, and men, women, children, the pious, and men of action will die, and the Torah is forgotten by those who study it. Baravi'it, fourth. Sova ve'ino sova. During the fourth year, there will be plenty, but not great plenty. There will be plenty, but not enough to satiate you. Bachamishit, sova gadol, ve'ochlin, ve'shotin, ve'smechin, during the fifth year, there will be great plenty, and they will eat and drink and rejoice, and the Torah will return to those who study it. It's the fifth. Going to the sixth. The sixth, it says, kolot. What are the kolot? Heavenly voices. People will start hearing things like the kolot and the bakim from the uh, uh, Mount Sinai. <clears throat> and on the seventh, here we go. Milchamot, during the sabbatical year, wars, meaning the war of Gog and Magog will be waged involving the Jewish people. Ube Motzei Shviit, like Motzei Shabbat, right? Ben David Ba, the son of David, will come. Amar Rav Yosef, Ha Kama Shviit, Rabbi Yosef said, haven't there have been already several sabbatical cycles? Right? He says, during which events transpired that, uh, that in that manner, and nevertheless the Messiah did not come. In other words, we've seen this throughout history. Abaye said, during the six-year heavenly voices and during the sabbatical years, wars transpired. He says, when did that happen? And furthermore, all of these phenomena transpired in the order in which they were listed in the Brita. In other words, these things did happen but did all of them happen, and in this particular order? Apparently not. Now, Psalms 89.52 says, the verse states, that your enemies taunted, Lord, that they have taunted the footsteps of your anointed. It is taught in the Brita that Rabbi Yehuda said, during the generation that the son of David comes, the hall of the assembly of the sages will be designated for prostitution. It says, Omer uh, ben David ba, Babo Beit Havad Vaad is like management, right? Iel is nut, prostitution. <clears throat> so I would say that it's pretty accurate, a uh, pretty accurate description considering the current state of affairs in uh, the state of Israel. Vagalil Yechara Vagavlan Yesham Veanshe Gvuli Sovevu Meir Leir Veloy Chonenu. And the Galilee will be destroyed, and the Gavlan, i.e., the Golan Bashan, will be desolate, and the residents of the borders who flee the neighboring Gentiles will circulate from city to city and will receive no sympathy. As we discussed, the war will come from the north, currently on our borders. The northern borders is very busy. Look it up. Who's sitting on Israel's northern borders? In the meantime, Hamas down south is also testing their rockets. Thanks, Iran. Where'd they get the money to support that? Hmm. Okay. V'chokhmat ha-sofrim tisrach ve'irei chet imasu u'pnei hador k'pnei ha-kelev. The wisdom of scholars will diminish and sin-fearing people will be despised. And the face of the generation will be like the face of a dog in its impudence and shamelessness. Do we have 2020 vision yet? Right? Now, you're going to love this next part. It's my favorite. <coughs> From Isaiah 59. So, Isaiah 59, which we have to read this because it's all relevant, but then we're going to focus on that verse, and boy, oh boy. Behold, the hand of the Lord is not too short to save, neither is his ear too heavy to hear. So use that and cry out to him. But your iniquities were separating between you and between your God, 
and your sins have caused him to hide his face from you, that he not hear. Notice the hints of correlation of hiding one's face to hearing the word of God. Okay? Hestiru panim mikem mishmoa. Because you hide your face. Okay? This is a sign of fear. And if you walk around like this, who are you afraid of? If you think this thing is going to save you, who are you afraid of? Where are you putting your faith? That's what separates you from God. <clears throat> For your hands were defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken falsehood. Your tongue mutters injustice. No one calls sincerely and no one is judged faithfully, trusting in vanity and speaking lies. Hmm. Conceiving injustice and begetting wickedness. What do you see on TV? Look what's around you. You know, you know these things are lies, but you still allow it to get under your skin. How about inside your body? Verse 5, they hatched vipers' eggs and they weave spider webs. Whoever eats of their eggs shall die. And what hatches emerges as a viper. Isaiah. Thank you, Isaiah. Maybe it'll get to some people. Their webs shall not become a garment, neither shall they cover themselves with their deeds. Their deeds are works of wickedness, and there is a deed of violence in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of wickedness. Robbery and ruin are in their paths. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever goes on it knows no peace. Two and two together. Therefore, justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light and behold, there is darkness for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We tap a wall like blind men and like those who have no eyes, we tap. Is this it? Is this the truth? Is it whatever you tell me, I'll believe. We have stumbled at midday, like in the darkness of night, in dark places like the dead. We all growl like bears and like doves we moan. We hope for justice, but there is none for salvation, but it has distanced itself from us. Why, why, why do you think anything is coming to you? Do you think you are worthy or deserving, depending how you lived your life? For our transgressions against you are many, and our sins have testified against us. Literally, as we said, whenever you sin, it creates an angel that will tell, I am this person's sin on this and this time, this and this date. They follow you your entire life. They escort you when you die before the heavenly court, and they're like, hi, remember me? Because I never forgot you. <clears throat> for our transgressions against you are many and our sins have testified against us for our transgressions are with us mm -hmm. and our iniquities we know them in other words we know what we're doing yet we do it anyway because god knows our heart right rebellion and denying the lord and drawing away from following our god speaking oppression and perverseness sprouting and giving forth the heart words of falsehood and justice has turned away backward and righteousness stands from afar for the truth has stumbled in the street and straightforwardness cannot come <clears throat> here we go and truth is lacking and he who turns away from evil is considered mad did you hear that oh you're not getting with the program look at Look at the crazy guy over there with the thing. Come, get in line like the rest of us. And the Lord saw and was displeased, displeased, for there is no justice. And he saw that there was no man, and he was astounded, for there was no intercessor. And his arm saved for him, and his righteousness that supported him. And he donned righteousness like a coat of mail, and a helmet of salvation is upon his head, and he donned garments of vengeance as his attire, and he was clad with zeal as a cloak. This all, all these things are leading to Isaiah 63. According to their deeds, according, he shall repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he shall pay recompense. And from the west, 
Who's in the West? And from the West they shall fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, that's the East, that's opposite from the West, his glory for distress shall come like a river. The Spirit of the Lord is wondrous in it. And a Redeemer shall come to Zion, Mazaltov, and to those who repent of transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words that I have placed in your mouth shall not move from your mouth or from the mouth of your seed and from the mouth of your seed's seed, says the Lord, from now and to eternity. My Deret, what is the meaning of the phrase, and the truth is lacking? Ne'ederet means literally missing, is gone. Imrei debi rav medamed, shenasat adarim adarim. The sages of the study hall of Rav say that uh, this teaches that the truth will become like so many flocks and walk away, just like the sheep that are lining up like lambs to be slaughtered. Because that's what they're told to do for our own benefit, of course. The, the, the cure is going to save us. That's, yeah. So the truth is like an adjacent line. And it's just walking away and no one's taken hold. But, bah, right? What is the meaning of the phrase, and he that departs from evil is negated? The sages of the study hall of Rabbi Sheila said, Anyone who deviates from evil is deemed insane by people. You see, as long as people, both close to me or far, call me a conspiracy theorist, I know I'm on the right path. And in turn, and unfortunately so, I know what path they are on. I'm screaming. Nobody's listening. But that's... What, what, what can I do, right? Really, what can you do? There are those that see, and there are those that don't even want to look. I choose to look and to search, because what else you got? Now I can understand it could be terrifying, descending into darkness. But we've learned time and time again that that is exactly where Jacob needs to go in order to gather the sparks of Kedusha. In this case, it would be Jacob in Egypt, okay, in our Parsha. So before the descent that we, um, that we are currently going through right now, it's, uh, before it becomes obvious to everyone, we must uh, prepare. How do you prepare? First and foremost, you got to know who controls all things because we're, we're currently in the descent, if you haven't noticed. And you have to give recognition. 46.1 And Israel and all that was his set out and came to Beersheba and he slaughtered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Right. So we have already learned. Why did he say all that was his? Pharaoh said, leave your stuff there. I got new vessels for you over here. Yes. But what do we learn? When Jacob crossed over the river, why? Was one of the reasons why he crossed over when he fought the angel of Esau. For the small vessels, right? Because everything that a righteous person owns, it's rightfully earned. And since he earned it rightfully and righteously, then it must have been given by God. And if it was given to him by God, then it must serve a purpose. And if it must have a purpose, then we do not discard that which God gives us. You see how this thing works. Another explanation for all that was his means that all his Ruach HaKodesh went with him and the Shekhinah and all the glory that has returned to him, all with him, despite the fact that he was about to go into the darkest place in the world. Now, why did he stop by in Be'er Sheva? Because that was also the dwelling place of both Abraham and Isaac. It was a holy spot. And it was uh, fully spiritual and illuminated. The seven wells, wells, water, Torah, lights, yes. In other words, he went for a last recharge before his descent. He gave sacrifices as a recognition to the master of the universe, as any Torah-observing individual should before they embark on just about anything. You don't have to give a sacrifice today, obviously, but you could recognize. I got to go here. I just got this opportunity. Should I do that? I need some help. 
and turn to God and ask him. And why only to the God of his father Isaac and not to the God of Abraham? Because Abraham represents mercy. And he had plenty of that. The Shekhinah had returned to him after 22 years. His son Joseph was alive and was ruler over Egypt. He and all his sons were going to be cared for and treated like royalty for the rest of their lives. The prophecies that he saw way back then have now finally come to fruition. Jacob was basically riding on the Chesed train to Egypt. But he had to just double check with God on the side of Isaac, judgment. Remember how this whole story started in Toldot? It all began with judgment. We're about to see the end of that. So he had to check in with the God of his father, Isaac, judgment, Elohim, judgment, that it was in fact okay for him to descend. As we recall, there was a famine in the land during the days of Isaac as well, and he was about to descend to Egypt, but God told him to stay and that he would take care of him. So he did, and he did. Which is one of Isaac's great merits, that he never set foot outside the land of Israel. Now, I think we explained this once before. It's because his soul was too high and too holy to dwell anywhere other than the land, because after the Akedah, he was considered more spiritual than he was physical. He was more so in Gan Eden than he was here on earth. And since he beseeched the judgment of God, so the judgment aspect of God answered him. Vayomer Elohim leisrael b'marot halayla Vayomer Yaakov Yaakov Vayomer Hineni And God said to Israel in visions of the night, and he said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here I am, right? Elohim, judgment. Jacob, Jacob, for strength, haste, and a complete covering. I got you. Vayomer, Anochi ha'el Elohei avicha. Al tira mireda mitzrayma ki legoi gadol asimcha sham. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid of going down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. Now, in this verse, God shows Jacob exactly why he is to descend and how he is to descend. Vayomer anochi ha'el. What is el? El is mercy. Elohei is from Elohim, meaning judgment. Avicha, very specifically, Isaac, meaning mercy and judgment. I am the God of mercy and judgment. Do not be afraid when you descend Mitzrayma with the additional hey, because not only is God, uh, not only is God via the Shechina with Tiferet Yaakov, mercy and judgment going to dwell with him, but the Shechina is already in the place of his future dwelling through Yosef, i.e. Yehosef, the extra hey, is in Mitzrayim over there, making it Mitzrayma. Also, al tira mireda mitzrayma, you will not lose any of your spirit when you are there. To the contrary, for there I will make you into a great nation. In fact, the older Jacob got, the higher he got. That's why, all the, yeah, let me tell you what's going to happen at the end of the day, because I see it like it's right before me. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up, and Joseph will place his hands over your eyes. Just like God promised to be with Jacob in his descent, so too will he be with Israel when he, they, we, ascend. Again, So, don't forget what's coming next. And Joseph, Joseph, the pride and joy of Jacob, he will not see the death of his son. The other way around. Furthermore, as a side note, Joseph had the longest reign out of any king in Israel. Although he was not king of Israel or in Israel, nevertheless, he reigned for 80 years. Very impressive. And while he did, Egypt became the world's first economic superpower. Yashit Yado shall extend his hand and not place his hand, because that would be yasim. Lasim is to place. Yashit is lehoshit yad, to extend his hand upon your eyes. Yashit has the numerical value of 720, which is 10 times 72, meaning the 72 letters within, this te- within the 10 sfirot. Yado, his hand, means God's right hand of mercy whenever we see that. God is showing Jacob that he will truly be united with 
yesod and be blessed beyond abundance, beyond what you can possibly imagine, Jacob. And Jacob could imagine quite a bit because he was blessed in with abundance his life. Yes, he went through all the suffering. Nevertheless, Jacob was like, yeah. Upon his eyes, as that is all Jacob will see for the rest of his life, upon his eyes, he will see God's hand of mercy upon his eyes. You see this? Nothing but God's love, goodness, blessing, and abundance. His sons living in peace, together, thriving. What more could a father want? What more could this father want? And this is the pinnacle of what life means. You ready for it? And Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their young children and their wives in the wagons Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And Jacob arose, because it was Jacob who was chosen, and it was Jacob who fought the battles, and it was Jacob who went through all the troubles. That's why Vayechi Yaakov and not Vayechi Israel, because we think, oh, Vayechi is a... It's that guy. That guy down there. Not that guy did it. He rose from nowhere. And Jacob was lifted by the children of Israel. Did you get that? Again, and Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob. His kids just got elevated. You understand what's going on? We're mixing heaven and earth right now. Just like there is Jacob down here and Israel up there, there are the tribes down here and the tribes up there. Shifteya, Shvatim, Shifteya, right? The children of Jacob are here while the children of Israel are up there. And the children of Israel from up there are lifting up Jacob from down here. And the children of Israel can only be Israel when each and every one of them is shining at full capacity and elevating themselves to their rightful place before the throne of God. At this point, you know, all his sons did full tshuva and they were all as one. And we will see this. They were all one, united, perfected, and as a result, Jacob was lifted. And when Israel are one and Jacob is lifted, who else is beneath him carrying him? The wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. Last week we discussed that it was Yosef who sent him the message within the wagons, right? It said that the wagons that Joseph sent, Joseph sent the message within Pharaoh's wagons. But this shows us right here that the left side, the side of the Kalipa, Pharaoh, the Tum'ah, got together with the side of Kedusha, with the sons of Israel, to give honor to Jacob, our father. Do you understand what's happening? All the souls coming to Egypt. I got to read this in Hebrew. Kol hanefesh haba It doesn't say souls. All the soul, all of Israel is one nefesh. This shows the unity. Kol hanefesh haba leYakov mitzrayma yotzei yircho milvad neshem neYakov kol nefesh shishim hashesh or sixty six. We're going to go through the count in a second. It's funny though that it says yotzei uh, yircho. Those who um, uh, all the souls coming to Egypt with Jacob. It doesn't even translate it in the English. So yotzei yircho yerich is his hip, as in the part that was dislocated by the Satan. You understand this? So it wasn't really his hip that was dislocated by the Satan. It was his brit, not dislocated, obviously, but smacked. Why? Because he married sisters. And in the Torah, you can't do that. Nevertheless, he did that for the salvation of the world. Another teaching. Anyway, very cool. Ubnei Yosef asher yulad lo nefesh shnaim. Nefesh, one soul, two. You see, it's all, we're all one. You say that, no, we are one. Shnaim kol ha-nefesh lebeit Yaakov ha-bayim Yitzrayim shivim all the soul of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. Each soul of Israel to inherit a nation while God, each number, each one of Israel to inherit a nation while God's heritage is Israel. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they acquired property in it, and they were prolific and multiplied greatly. Israel just became the united nation. And as a result, my friends, and Jacob lived. 
now. If you've made it this far in the teaching, congratulations, and you're actually paying attention to what I was saying and also not saying, and you have an uncomfortable and possibly an unpleasant feeling, then don't worry about it. <clears throat> Everything's going to be okay if... Everything is going to be okay if you have little to no attachment to this world and this system and you have complete faith in God. But, but if you are attached to this world, i.e. your material possessions, your own ideas, to the me of the here, then by default, you have no faith in God. Because you think you got whatever you got because of you. And if that's the case, then, well, then everything is not going to be okay. Jeremiah 30. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, just stay with me, stay with me. So that the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, write for you the words that I have spoken to you on a scroll. For behold, days are coming says the Lord, when I will restore the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will restore them to the land that I gave their forefathers, and they shall possess it. Now the Ramad says that these days, the days that are coming, Yamim Baim, are the end of days when the Shekhinah that has accompanied all of Israel collectively and individually into exile as a fellow captive will return to its rightful place along with us. My people Israel and Judah, he says, these are the 10 tribes returning home as well, most of which have no idea who they actually are until they will be told, right? You're this tribe, you're that tribe, you're this tribe, you're that tribe. What are you doing here? You understand? This is where the Shekhinah will reconnect with the patriarchs for the final rectification of the world in other words, Malchut Shaddai, uh, uh, Tikkun Olam, right? The kingdom of Shaddai. What is Shaddai? The three-pronged Shin. Shin looks like this, representing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what is the Dai? That is the numerical value of David, who is the fourth, technically the fourth patriarch. They're making the Melkava, uh, just because this. But you know this already, right? Chesed, Gvura, Vetiferet going all the way down to Malchut. This is what it's all about. Through Yesod, obviously, we've learned this stuff. And these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For so said the Lord, a sound of dread we have heard, fear, and there is no peace. Okay, great. There is your judgment before the peace. Because until God says there is peace, there is no peace. So please take note as to all this peace that our neighbors whose lifelong mission is to wipe us out all of a sudden, they got a change of heart. Okay, this is, it's politics. It's not Torah. God says right here that there is no peace. We're being played. Do not confuse peace with quiet. Okay, it's a very, very big difference. There is an agenda. There is no peace. Regard, I, don't argue with me. God says it, okay? I'm just reading. Regardless, it's like, um, it's not even debatable, okay? Thus saith the Lord. We'll go with that. And now, ask now, and see whether a male gives birth. Why have I seen every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in confinement, and every face has turned pale? Has anyone seen a dude give birth? I mean, maybe nowadays, who knows, right? This is a reiteration of the judgment preceding mercy. The male, meaning the right side, is mercy. Why have I seen every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in confinement? Now he brings the verse in Isaiah 40, the famous Nachamu, Nachamu Ami, take comfort, take comfort, my people, which we read after the harshest judgment of Tisha B'Av when we lost both temples. Verse 5, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. <clears throat> And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh together shall see that the mouth of the Lord spoke. Now, venigla kavod Hashem, right? Glory has a numerical value, kavod, of 32, lev. Lev means heart. 
but also there are 32 pathways of chokhmah, wisdom, for from creation. While there are 320 judgments from creation, the nokvin, meaning that there are 10 times the amount 32. And these are called dinin de churin. Now, again, this is heavy stuff. We don't need to get into this, okay? But it's the fusing of the male and the female letters along with their judgments and their mercies. The judgment always comes from around while the mercy is inside. God is building the judgments before the, mer uh, before the mercy. Now focus on that. And it's funny, I was just reading the uh, Ramcha last weekend. Unfortunately, Yaakov is the right side, right? And then the left side... The right side, including the left and the right, but the positive left and the right. And Esav and Ishmael and Amalek are on the left side. But if Esav would have done what he was supposed to do, it would be Yaakov in the center and Esav, who would be the good, who was supposed to be the good part of judgment around him, right? Like bursting out of a shell. Both necessary. <clears throat> so God is building the judgments before mercy. Just keep that in mind, because this is the theme. And since this final redemption will be just that. Hoy, ki gadol hayom ahu me'en kamo v'et tsara hi le'akov u'mimena yivasha. Hoy, oh, for that day is great, with none like it. And it is a time of distress for Jacob, though which he shall be saved. Yep, u'mimena yivasha. I'm sorry, not though. Through, he will be saved. Through the judgments, he will be saved. Jacob will be saved from all these judgments, but he must go through in order to attain the mercy. Israel, <clears throat> do not fear. And it shall be on that day, says the Lord of hosts. We're going back to Jeremiah. That I will break his yoke off your neck, and I will break, uh, I will break your strongholds, and the strangers shall no longer enslave them, my people, whose yoke, what yoke? Those who enslave you currently. You think you're free, but you're still in bondage. You don't even know it. What's the first commandment of the Ten Commandments? Anochi Hashem, Elohecha. That's where people, I'm the Lord your God. Did what? Who took you out of Egypt? But you keep forgetting that. Because if you remember that, you would know that everything is part of God's plan. Wait, I'll get to it. And they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, who I will set up for them. God will set up David. King David is the King Mashiach. And the Neshama of David will enter into Ben David, into the person that is a piece of the Neshama of David will enter into him. But wait, there's, there's more coming. It's going to be a whole Neshama cocktail over there. Asher Akim Lahem, who I will raise for them. What is Jacob? Um, what does Jacob bless Judah with in our parsha in forty nine nine? Gul bnei alita, bnei alita kara ravatz uchelavi meno a cub and a grown lion is Judah from the prey. My son, you withdrew. He crouched rested like a lion, and like a lion, who will rouse him? God will raise him. Don't worry, we'll get to that too. And you, fear not, my servant Jacob, says the Lord, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I save you from afar and your seed from the land of your captivity. And Jacob shall again be silent and at ease, and no one will frighten him. Vayich Yaakov, and Jacob lived. Here we go. For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, for I will make an end of the nations where I dispersed you. But of you, I will not make an end, but I will chasten you in measure, but I won't completely destroy you. Now, this is very telling. Read what God says. The nations where there are the most Jews are going to get hit the hardest. According to this, I will destroy the nations where I sent you, for I will make an end of all nations where I dispersed you. So let's put things into perspective here. I don't know. All right. As of 2019, there are about 14.7 million Jews in the world. 6.8 of them are in Israel, where we're still being held captive. What? Don't, don't, don't look at me like that, okay? Uh, 5.7 are in the U.S., where they're definitely being held captive. Ever hear of a gilded cage? Come on. 
The Jews that haven't left yet while they had the chance may not necessarily get a chance or may come with nothing if they do. Next on the list is France with 450,000, Canada afterwards with uh, 392, and then there's like 292 in uh, the UK and so on. Okay, what nations are going down? And so if their lives of luxury and comfort are what's keeping them from where they need to be, when they had a chance, God will destroy the idolatry that is separating his children from him. You see that? You see this? Okay. And you'll see it. It'll come through the nations themselves, expelling the Jews, taking their money and their belongings. Remember? Everything is going to be okay. If you have little to no attachment to this world, and you have complete faith in God. But if you are attached to this world, i.e. your material possessions, the nice big houses that you got there, your businesses, your cars, your this, your that, whatever, then by default, you have no faith in God. Sorry. I'm, 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 reading, I'm reading prophets here. So are you reading the same thing I'm reading? Because you think you got whatever you got because of you. Then everything is not going to be okay. Harsh words? Yes, I know, Jeremiah was killed for them, and yet they needed to be said. For so said the Lord, your injury is painful, your wound grievous. No one deems your wound to be healed. You have no healing medicines. Uh-oh. All of your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you, for I have smitten you with the wound of an enemy. Cruel chastisement for the greatness of your iniquity. Your sins are many. And you still doubt? Why do you cry about your injury that your pain is severe? What's happening? For the magnitude of your iniquity, since your sins are many, I have done this to you. Don't go crying anti-Semitism when you choose to stay where you are, and you choose to close your eyes, and you choose to align yourselves with those who hate you in hopes that they won't turn on you? What? Everything that's going on in the world is about you right now. God wants you here. You ever Robocop, dead or alive, you're coming with me? Make no mistake. I have done this to you, thus saith the Lord. And because I did this to you due to your iniquity, of course, don't worry. Therefore, all who devour you shall be devoured. But first, they're going to have to devour you. Then I'll take care of them. But this needs to happen because you can't be there anymore. All who devour you shall be devoured. And all your adversaries, yea, all of them, shall go into captivity. And those who plunder you shall be plunder. And all who prey upon you I will give for prey. For I will bring healing to you. God's going to bring healing to you because you're about to get smacked. And of your wounds, I will heal you, says the Lord, for they called you an outcast. That is Zion whom no one seeks out. What are we talking about? Still true. So says the Lord, behold, I am returning the captivity of the tents of Jacob and his dwellings I will pity and the city shall be built on its mound. And the palace on its proper site shall be established. Uh, okay. Let's quickly read through because this is, we got the bad stuff. Let's get the good stuff, okay? And thanksgiving in the voice of those, um, of those mesachim being merry, whatever, shall proceed from them and I will multiply them and they shall not be diminished and I will increase them and they shall not become few in number. It's going to be more of us, a lot more of us, because there are people out there who don't know that they're Israel and their children shall be as of old and their congregation shall be established before me and I will visit evil upon all of their oppressors. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. And their prince shall be from them, and their ruler shall emerge from their midst, and I will bring him near, and he shall approach me, only because I'm the one who brings him near. For who is it who pledges his heart to approach me, says the Lord? Who can come next to God unless I call him? Nobody. That's why you know where people stand. It's how close they are to God, and that's all God's doing. Who is this prince? Of course, we know it's Mashiach. 
but read the words. We have a prince and we have a ruler, right? There's a prince and a ruler. The prince meaning the king, Judah, and the ruler meaning Joseph. And they are both necessary, venigash elai, and he drew near to me. Sound familiar, vaigash elav, Yehuda, and Judah drew near. He is from the root of learning Torah, which is Malchut, and from the root of Yesod. These are the, both, the two of them, okay? You need these two. Yesod feeds Malchut, and then Malchut goes straight up, Yesod, Tiferet, Dad, Keter, and so on and so forth. It all has to funnel down for it to rise all the way up. He will rise above Yesod to the highest of heights, all the way to the Ancient of Days. And if that sounds familiar, Daniel 7. But as for the other beasts, their dominion was removed. Ring. And they were given an extension of life until the set time. You guys are going to need to do what you're going to do. You need to oppress my people because I kind of need them to get shaken up so they can come back, right? But then... I saw in the visions of the night, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, and he was brought before him, and he gave him dominion and glory and kingdom, and all peoples, nations, and tongues shall serve him. His dominion is an eternal dominion, which will not be removed, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Once the heart and the mind are as one, the rest of the body falls into place. We are all nefesh achat, right? And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, a storm from the Lord has gone forth with fury, yea, a settling storm on the heads of the wicked. It shall rest. It's like Jeremiah and Isaiah conspired together. The, kind, the kindling of the Lord's anger shall not return until he has executed it and until he has fulfilled the plans of his heart. At the end of the days you shall consider it. In other words, you will, you will behold it. You will understand everything. At that time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they shall be my people. Families of Israel. You want to attach yourself to somebody, you know who to do it to. Eheye, it says, I will be the upper Shechina. Ba'etahi ne'um Hashem, Eheye. Right? What did God tell Moses to tell the people? Eheye is my name. I shall be. Le'elohim, that's the upper Shechina, the lower Shechina. But I will also be judgment. We are going through troubles and we will go through troubles. Believe it, acknowledge it, understand it, prepare for it, and go with it. Because God said so. And we do all this so that we as Jacob may live. This is the ride that you're going through right now. This is happening. Free from any of the Klipa, the Sitra Achra, the Samech Mem, Esav, Ishmael, and Amalek. To live just like Jacob did after the trouble. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years. And Jacob's day, days, the years of his life, were 147 years. 17 is the numerical value of the word Tov. Is, is good, as in God saw the light and it was good, and God separated between the light and between the darkness. We are currently, right now, entering the stages, the final stages of separation. You are about to see truly who is of the light and who is of the dark. There will be no question anymore. The heir of Rav are about to show their faces. And the end of the darkness means the coming of the light. So get ready. There's a reason Jacob was not allowed to share exactly what was going to happen and when it was going to happen, although he saw every last detail. He saw me do it. Hi, hello, Father Jacob. He saw that back then. If we knew exactly how and who and when, right, those who would not be around during that time, they'd kind of let go. But you got to hope every single day. Is all Israel asking for Mashiach today? No. They're asking for all the distractions. Why do you think all these distractions are being thrown at you? So people say, oh, I want to get this because this will help my situation. I want more this, I want more that. No one's looking at God. God, help us. God, bring us Mashiach and all this. But we're not. This shows you our state. And it's going to keep getting worse until we finally say, okay, there is no solution here. Focus up there, and then what's going to happen? God heard their cry, and behold, Moses, get down there. Do your thing. <sighs> but 
We have been given signs of the times, prophecies upon prophecies. Most of them, they've already come true to the letter. Okay, we don't know exactly when, but we see what's coming. Some of which remain, of the prophecies that remain, I've shared with you today. And I hope we know by now that God's word does not return void. Okay, so, oh no, that, uh, then why did he say it? What, just to scare you? These things are happening. You have to understand, there's this misconception in, in Judaism that, I mean, obviously, a negative prophecy can be overturned. A positive prophecy will remain positive, but a negative prophecy can be over, uh, overturned if you don't do tshuva. But that's what the whole Torah says. It's all about tshuva. It's all about tikkun, right? <coughs> Nevertheless, God says he will revisit, bring all the iniquity upon the nations that harmed us. This is going to happen. And those that do not return will suffer the consequences along with the nations until then I will pull them out. These things are going to happen, have happened, and are currently happening. Uh, Judah, as for you, your brothers will acknowledge you. Your hand will be at the nape of your enemies, and your father's sons will prostrate themselves to you. Your brothers will acknowledge you because you took responsibility when no one was watching with Tamar. And just like you stood up and acknowledged it, so too will your brothers stand up and acknowledge you. Yadcha be'oef oivecha. Your hand will be at the nape of your enemies. This is wonderful stuff. The first letters of these words, Yadcha be'oef oivecha, are Yavo, will come. And Yadcha, your hand, what is the, what did we discuss her, uh, earlier, the value of Yad, the numerical value? It's of David. David will come. Judah, right? Hey, don't worry, Judah. David will come, and his hand will be upon the nape of his enemies. We can even see this in Psalms 18.41 or 2 Samuel 22.41. It's the same text, just with the extra nun in the, in the Psalms. Uh, in Samuel, it says, So there's just missing a nun over there. And my enemies, you have given me the back of their necks, the nape of their necks. Those that hate me, that I may cut them off. Thank you very much, King David. And your father's sons, your father's sons, all of them, not just your mother's sons, because it's all the tribes, right? Jacob had several wives, will prostrate themselves to you. David Melech, Israel, Chai Vekayam, back then and soon again. Gur Arie Yehuda, mi teref beni alita kara ravatska arie, uchelavi, mi yakimenu. A cub and a grown lion is Judah. From the prey, my son, you withdrew. He crouched, rested like a lion, and like a lion, who will rouse him? He was a cub. When was he a cub? <coughs> when King Saul was the king of Israel. This was before his time. He's been around, you know. Wait for your roar, Simba, right? And then he became the lion of the tribe of Judah when it was time for him to reign. Miteref, from the prey, which are the words Yehuda spoke to Jacob regarding Joseph. And they sent the fine woolen coat through Judah, their leader. He's the one that came and brought it to Jacob. And they, because it says they, because they were all part of it, including the Shekhinah, which both Joseph and Jacob came to know. They brought it to their father and said, we have found this and I recognize it whether it's your son's coat or not. Now, he recognized it and said, it's my son's coat. And while beasts has devoured him, Joseph has surely been torn up. Miteref, tarof taraf, same thing. And it's because of this, my son, now it came about that time that Judah descended from his brothers and he turned away until he came to an Adelite man named Hira. But since then, right, because Judah said, allowed uh, Jacob to say, tarof taraf Yosef, since then he came up a cub, a grown lion is Judah. From the prey, my son, you have risen. In other words, you have descended into darkness. I just realized this yesterday when it says that he descended and he turned away. There was like a double thing, yarad vayet. In other words, 
There was more to this. I didn't have time to really delve into that, but I will. A cup of grown lion is Judah from the prey, my son, you have risen. Judah descended into darkness and filth for the sake of the lost sparks. And through your acquisition, after ripping apart the Sitra Achra, you have risen, meaning that you will rise. Also, Yehuda did this with his own uh, Yetzirah, right? Taking responsibility and then fighting for his brother, ready to destroy the world. And once you have risen and established yourself, you crept. I am not roar. Judah, you crouched, you rested, you lay wait for the right time, the right moment when your brothers and your enemies least expect it. And like a lion who will rouse him. And they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, who I will set up for them. God will raise him up. And he will be more powerful than ever before. Now we see three descriptions of Judah regarding David, and they all have different meanings. We see Gul, Elie, and Levi. Gul is a lion cub. As we discussed before, he was king. Elie, while he was king, and Levi. What is Levi? Ask Levi. While he was at full strength vanquishing his enemies. It's like a charging lion. Ah, that's that. So the word Levi has the same numerical value as Gadol. Mighty. Mighty lion. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the student of the law from between his feet. Although it says between his legs. Until Shiloh comes, and to him will be a gathering of peoples. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now, how could this be, right? We've seen plenty of times that Judah has not ruled over Israel, or at all. The thing is, it has been decreed in the highest realm that it shall never depart from Judah. In other words, it's always going to be yours. Right now, these people, they might be taking turns. You're going to rest for a while, but it belongs to you, no one else. And although it was not always taking place down here, because it is stated this way, it means that it has been decreed in the heavens, and there is no changing it nor can anyone or anything take its place. And our sages have used these examples before to deny is like uh, saying that there is no sunlight or daylight at noon. The student of law from between his legs. When something is a chok, what do we discuss? It's the law, statute, is it, it is eternal for all things and it never ends. And as we know that the Torah is called the law, and it will never pass away because these are the words of God. And who did he impart them to? Israel, who is led by Judah. And so the student of the law means that Israel shall live under Judah, through Judah, according to the Torah. And it is very specifically through because all the abundance of the Zir and Pin, i.e. the Torah, comes uh, comes to Israel, to Malchut, Judah, through the Yesod, the covenant, which is anatomically between your legs and through the abundance given to Israel the rest of the world will be sustained as well Ad ki avo shilo, until Shiloh comes we're talking Torah here and what does the Torah say about the rest of the nations they will surely serve Israel after God shakes things up of course and this is the law and who is the giver of the law Shiloh, which is the same numerical value as Moshe, thank you very much, Veloi uh, Katamim, uh, gather people. He won't gather peoples, but darken them, because it's a bad translation in English. Where do we get this from? Ikat, right? Ezekiel 18.2. Why do you mean when you use the parable, parable over the land of Israel, saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? Again, kehe is darkened, meaning that Moses will cause the nations who enslaved Israel to be darkened and they themselves will be enslaved to Israel. Kind of like a role reversal over there. Continuing with Judah. He binds his foal to a vine, and to a tendril he binds his young donkey. <coughs> he launders his garment with wine, and with the blood of grapes binds his raiment. Now, here you go. Through the grapevine, right? It sounds a lot like Isaiah 63, which uh, all these coincide together with. Just like a piece of the neshama of David will enter into King Mashiach, so too will a piece of Moshe Rabbeinu. Finally, he will be able to enter the land of Israel because he's still out there right now. Suffering servant, Isaiah 53, Moshe Rabbeinu. 
he was our first redeemer after all. And it says, Achrit and he will also partake in the final redemption as well. Now, check this out. The Malchut is also referred to as Geffen, vine, grapes. Ulishraka Bani Etono. He binds his uh, atono, he binds his young donkey. The foal and the donkey represent the Samechmem, the angel who is a minister over uh, over Esav, the Satan, and Rahav, or Rahav, excuse me, who is the ministering angel of Ishmael. While Israel are in exile, they rule over the vine. But when the redemption comes, Israel will rule over them. We're attached to each other. Now you think that you're holding us. No, no, we're actually holding you, right? You know, what was that line from Watchmen? He goes, you guys don't understand. You think, I'm not locked in here with, I'm not, what is it? You're not, I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. Right, okay. He launders his garment with wine and with the blood of his grapes binds his raiment. So this is exactly like we read it, almost exactly in Isaiah 63. Read it. The blood of the grapes are the gvurot. Wine is gvura, right? Judgments that will be poured out upon the nations. Levusho, his garments. This is very telling as the garments are external. You can remove the garments, the judgments. Get it? What we have been saying for the past hour, judgment before mercy. So if the judgment is on the outside, <coughs> then what must be on the inside? He is red-eyed from wine and white-toothed from milk. Red, wine, judgment, white, milk, mercy. Okay, but the balance is complete now. Now, who is the perfect balance of mercy and judgment? Mercy and judgment. Stiferet, Jacob. He lives. And what did Jacob finally do once his troubles were over? He lives. But here's the thing in the last verse. You could ask, why does it mention judgment twice over the last two verses? And so the Ramad answers. There is a physical or a practical judgment, which is what's going to happen to the nations. And there is a judgment for study, like studying the law. <clears throat> you cannot dismiss the good part of judgment, of course. It's the, it's the study of the, the Talmud, the Mishnah. These are the, the judgments of the law. And so when Mashiach comes, there is a hint of the heights and wisdom that he will receive and possess so that the four corners of the earth will come and listen to his words of Torah. And they will all desire to drink of his wine made of these grapes. And what are these very particular, very special grapes? If you missed last week's teaching, I hope you didn't. Otherwise, this whole thing is just almost good for nothing. We brought forth the Talmud, Masechet Brachot. Rabbi Yochanan said that there is a reward referring to the verse, No eye has seen it. The Gemara asks, What is this reward about which is said, No eye has seen it? Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, That is the wine that has been preserved in its grapes since the six days of creation and which no eye has ever seen. Uh, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani said that is Eden which no creature's eye has ever surveyed. Now you might be thinking to yourself, we said, wait a minute, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, right? Yes, in the Garden, but not in Eden itself. Never in Eden because a river flows from Eden to water the Garden. And then they were expelled from the Garden, which is still outward to this world. And uh, that's what, that was Genesis 2.10. So the wisdom that Mashiach will impart to us and the, entire, the, and the entire world is of Eden itself, the place where no eye has seen except for God himself. My friends, we don't have to go anywhere to get to Eden. Eden will be brought to us. And so everything that's happening right now is a preparation for that. You must understand what is going on. The Ramchal in his book, Dat Tvunot, Knowing God's Plan, he sums it up perfectly. And I just got to give credit to my wife. She brought this to my attention because I was, this just helps to kind of tie it all together. You need, and I'm quoting, <coughs> you need to be aware of the following principle. God does not despise his handiwork and he never abandons the world, leaving it to its own devices. On the contrary, when the world seems as if he had abandoned it, he has in fact been preparing for a new influx of good. In other words, as bad as it's going to get, it's going to get really, really good. 
His wondrous deeds and thoughts are constantly directed towards the perfection of the world and not towards its destruction. Something's got to be taken out for new things to come in, right? It is just that <coughs> it is just that he conceals his plan to a very, very great extent. Consequently, the world seems abandoned while people suffer and punishment uh, for their sins. Remember what we said earlier in Isaiah? Why do you cry about your injury, that your pain is severe? For the magnitude of your iniquity, since your sins are many, but I have done this to you? He continues, this is what our sages were alluding to in the comments about our forefather Yaakov and Bereshit Rabbah 91.10. Israel said in Genesis 43.6, <coughs> while the brothers were trying to convince him to let Benjamin go down to Egypt, right? And Israel said, why have you harmed me by telling me that the man you have another brother? By telling the man you have another brother. So that's a funny place to put the name Israel, right? Jacob was in his like... Uh, a spiritual coma right here it should be Jacob what do you want from me get away from me leave me alone but it says Israel said Israel is the, is the supernal levels of Jacob which is why he wasn't only speaking to his sons here but rather to God as well on another level Rabbi Levi in the same in the name of Rabbi Chama Bar Hanina listen to this the, he says this these are the only incorrect words our forefather Yaakov ever spoke God said, I am busy making his son the king of Egypt while he says, why did you harm me? This is the meaning of the verse taken from Isaiah 40, that one, take comfort my people. Verse 27, why should you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way has been hidden from the Lord and from my God, my judgment passes. The meaning of the sage's words is that throughout the whole time, Yaakov was in anguish. Why? Because of his separation from Yosef. God was actually guiding the entire series of events, just like he has been from Bereshit Bara Elohim. Guiding all the series of events in order to make Yosef king and to enable Yaakov, Jacob, to live in tranquility. However, because this plan was so deeply hidden as it had to be otherwise, Jacob would never let this happen. Nobody would let this happen. Because it was so hidden, Jacob experienced suffering. Now he concludes, every elevation or improvement that God wishes to bestow upon man or the world is always preceded by pain, judgment before mercy. Are you struggling? Listen up, Israel. It's about to get terrible. Okay, I say with a smile on my face because of what is to come afterwards. Do you understand how exciting it is, the times that we are in? This is what you hold on to. I'm just going to keep reading this. Why should you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my ways has been hidden from before the, uh, hidden from the Lord, and from my God my judgment passes? Do you not know? If you have not heard, an everlasting God is the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He neither tires nor wearies. There is no fathoming his understanding. Who gives the tired strength? And to him who has no strength, he increases strength. Now, youth shall become tired and weary. Those who take it for granted, oh, I'm strong, I could do this by my own might. And the young men shall stumble. But those who put their hope in the Lord shall renew their vigor. They shall raise wings as eagles. You want to fly? They shall run and not weary. They shall walk and not tire. We understand all this from the heartbreaking and heartwarming verse in chapter 48, 11. And Israel said to Joseph, I have not expected to see even your face and behold, God has shown me your children too. Look at this. Vayomer Israel Yosef, Reo panecha lo pilalti, veine heraoti Elohim gametzarecha. Pilalti comes from the word plili, criminal, judicial, judgment. Jacob is confessing to Joseph the one wrong thing he ever spoke in his life. He said, My son, I have misjudged, but now I have been corrected. And behold, Elohim, God's righteous judgment has been made known to me. 
God showed me His judgment. God has shown me your children too. And it is greater than I have ever, ever possibly could have imagined. I didn't think I was going to make it. I never believed I would survive. I all but lost faith in the system that I once held on to so dearly. And yet, here I stand. It's during the times of trouble that we hope for great things to come. You have to lift yourself from the ashes before you go completely numb. And when you least expect it, all the pain, the anguish, and the fear will be gone. And that's when you will be shown the truth, which gives you the strength to carry on. God always loves you, will never leave you, be it earthquakes, fire, or a flood. And that's why we say together as one, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hold on to him and live. Thus concludes Sefer Bereshit. Chazak, chazak, 